The first lesson is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The second lesson is Matthew chapter 21, beginning at the first verse. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a coat, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Thank you. One of the problems with a service on a day like today is that we're so familiar with the, the passage it's one of those passages that perhaps every year on this day we go through, we use different Gospels, but it's the same message, it's the same um, story of Jesus riding into the town, into the city. And so as we look at it, sometimes it doesn't feel very fresh. So I just want to kind of give a little bit of background and then start looking at the passage in greater detail. In the previous chapter, there's a moment when Jesus actually steps aside with his disciples and it's, it says in chapter 20 verse 17 Jesus foretells his death a third time and I want you to just think, try and imagine for a few moments what it must have been like for those young men, those disciples they followed Jesus for three years and it must have been at times a very intense period with them and now he's turned his face to, the, to head to Jerusalem and he's talking about his death. Now let me just read to you what he said. As he was going to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside and on the way he said to them, See, we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they'll condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified and he will be raised on the third day. It tells us really that they didn't understand what he was talking about. To be on the outskirts of a city with a man who says what is going to happen to him, this most awful of experiences, this most awful of executions, the crucifixion, and to describe being flogged and scourged and mocked and spat upon, they must have been, in a sense, 
numb. Not numb being thick, but just not really able to comprehend what he was saying. And at the same time, they must have been afraid. If we're going there, he's going to be killed. What will happen to us? And as they progressed, they went to Jericho. And in Jericho, as he approached the city, there were two men sitting by the side of the road. They were blind and they heard he was going past and they began to shout and to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And he stopped and they were brought to him and he said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, we want to see. And he healed them. So the disciples would see this man who's doing these tremendous things. Last week, it was the Lazarus who had died and Jesus raised him again. And they're looking at this man, he's performing miracles that nobody else has ever been able to perform in ways that nobody else has been able to perform. And we're told by John at the end of his gospel that if everything he'd said and done had been written down, the whole world could not contain the books. So all that we have is a fraction of what the disciples experienced. And so as they move towards the city, a real mix of emotion, a real mix of feelings and confusion. Jericho is about 15 miles from Jerusalem, and that's actually less than a day's travel. So as people were making their way for the Passover to get to Jerusalem, they would stop off in Jericho. And it might even be they'd stop off there and they'd stay there until near the actual Passover, because it would be less crowded. And as they approached Jerusalem, and as the, they got near to the Passover, the Roman garrisons would be reinforced because it was a very emotive time. The people were celebrating a release from slavery in Egypt. And so as they talked about the Passover, they still recognized that they were under the dominance of Rome. And so the Romans were always anxious that there'd be insurrection or rioting or there'd be violence. And Jerusalem's not a big city. And if you imagine over a million people arriving for the Passover, I mean, if a million people arrived in any of our large towns, it would cause problems. A million people arriving, more than a million, arriving for the Passover at a very emotive time, the Romans would be anxious, the garrisons would be reinforced, and everything would be quite tense. And as they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, and he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he'll send them at once. Now, there's a big debate. Did he have divine knowledge, or did he plan it? We know on another occasion, he said to Peter, Peter was asked, does your master pay taxes? And Peter said, yes. In fact, he didn't. And so Jesus said to him, is it right that the son of the king pays taxes? And, Jesus, and Peter said, no. But because Peter had said, yes, Jesus pays taxes, Jesus then said to him, go into the sea and catch a fish, and the first fish you bring out will have a two denarii coin for your tax and for mine. And that's exactly what happened. No way you could plan an event like that. So Jesus had divine knowledge, divine authority to make these things happen. On another occasion, he said to Peter that you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. That happened. He said that one of you will betray me. And that happened. Uh, Judas Iscariot betrayed him. And so he knew things that ordinarily he couldn't know. But also we do know that Bethpage was a place that he frequently visited. He often stayed there. It's mentioned quite a number of times in the Gospels. So it's quite possible he had friends and disciples and people living in the village and he could have prearranged this. We don't know, and it doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that the enactment of going into the village, into the city on the donkey, was actually from Zechariah 9 9. Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. So Jesus knew as he went into the city on that donkey, the people would look and there would be a sense of excitement. We'll look again at that in a moment. If you've been to Israel or if you've been to Jerusalem, you'll know what it is like to stand on the Mount of Olives and to look at the city. Um, it's a very popular image of the city. You look down onto the Temple Mount, which is now mainly clear, it's a flat space, but at one side there is a mosque with a golden dome. And many, many of the pictures we see of Jerusalem have that golden dome. But at the time of Jesus, 
it would have been the temple, Herod's temple. And this was a huge, massive, glorious looking building. It had taken 40 years up to that point, 46 years up to that point to build it. And so as they came over the Mount of Olives, they'd looked down onto the city and dominating the view would be this huge white stone temple, ornate, elaborate, vast. It would have been a very impressive sight. Parts of it would have been coated with gold. And so as they came over the Mount of Olives, they would see that and then they'd start to go down the Mount of Olives towards the city. The whole thing was awesomely impressive and very, very effective. But Jesus, as he was going down, we are told by Luke, who gives a slightly different account. He says exactly the same things, but he adds a few details. As they went down the hill, um, down the Mount of Olives, the crowds saw him and they came out to him. And they were raising, uh, taking palm branches and clothing, and they were throwing it on the road, and they were shouting, and they were celebrating. And the psalm they were using, 118, was a kingly psalm used for worship. And it was one of six psalms, 113 to 118, were used at the Passover. And 118 was after the Passover, it was the final of the six psalms. And they were celebrating the liberation of the people the redemption of the people from Egypt. So as they celebrated these psalms, they were celebrating the Passover and remembering God's act of releasing them from slavery in Egypt. And here Jesus is coming down and they're quoting the same psalm now as he approaches the city. And he's knowing he wants to bring a different kind of liberation, but he's at odds with the people. And this is where the conflict comes. As he came down, they rushed out, they brought their palm branches, they brought the uh, clothing. And that's reminiscent of when, in 2 Kings, Elisha the prophet sent one of his junior prophets to Yehu, a commander in the army, to anoint Yehu as king. And the man arrived, and Yehu was with his fellow commanding officers, and they were eating a meal, and he asked to speak to Yehu in private. And Yehu and this prophet, they went into a back room and the man anointed him with oil and declared him to be king. Now when the prophet left, Yehu came out and you almost get the sense of a slight embarrassment because when his fellow officers said to him, and take note what they said, what did that madman want? Yehu said, oh nothing. He kind of dismissed it, but they were really insistent. They knew that something significant had happened. And Yehu then told them what the prophet had said and immediately they took off their cloaks and they threw them on the road in front of him to declare him king and they shouted Yehu is king. So this idea of putting your cloak down is biblical and it's something that um, is very significant. So when these people came out of the city throwing their cloaks on the floor and shouting king, behold at the quoting this, actually you've got a point then. Hosanna to the son of David. David was the great king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They were shouting this and they were declaring and it was just all exciting. Let's think about the disciples for a moment. A little earlier, he said to him, he's going to Jerusalem where he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles, flogged, scourged and crucified. And now, as they came down the hill, the disciples would see these crowds and I... I just sense, humanly speaking, they were excited and they were delighted and they were pleased that these people, they recognised Jesus as the Messiah and they came out to him. And I just wonder which of the disciples thought to himself, he's got this wrong. He's got this wrong. They're not going to kill him. But you see, they didn't understand. And I don't think anybody can blame them for not understanding what was, being, what was all happening here. This was all part of God's plan. And who could actually say, God has sent his son, born of a virgin, to have him crucified before the event? After the event, we understand it more. And even now, we only understand in part. There's many questions that we have about what was happening. But beforehand, I don't think anybody could grasp what was going on. And so as Jesus came down, these people came rushing out. And Luke tells us something quite interesting. He said that on the donkey, Jesus was weeping. Last week, when we talked about Lazarus, there was a point 
when Jesus was standing and he saw the people mourning, he saw their grief, he felt their grief. And in a very simple little sentence, John just puts, Jesus wept. And the word he used for wept is a, a word that, imagine a person is sitting in a room on their own quietly and there's just tears gently coming down their cheeks. It's that kind of weeping that was described there. But when Luke talked about it, he used a totally different word. And he talked about Jesus coming down the hill and weeping. And the word he used was much more powerful. It's the kind of grief that is uncontrollable. It's when you're sobbing, when the grief is really overwhelming and your shoulders are throbbing and you just, you just can't stop the tears and the, the phlegm. It's, it's just one of those awful moments when you look at somebody in absolute grief. That was Jesus coming down. And we have this whole conflict of emotion. The excitement of the crowd, the excitement and the confusion of the disciples, and the sadness and the grief of Jesus. What was going on here? Passover, the celebration of the redemption of Israel from the Egyptians. These people had come together, they'd heard about Jesus, they were excited to finally meet him and to see him, and they thought as he rode in on the donkey, he was going to lead them in revolution against the Romans. And if this prophet of God raised this revolution, they would win. That was the conviction. But Jesus was coming to do something quite different. And as he went into the temple, in verse 12, as Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. What we have here is the reason Jesus came. He came to purify the temple, to make it clean. But let's understand something. And this is really one of those root things that we need to build on as part of the foundation for our faith. When I go to London on the train from Oxford, we pull into Victoria Station and I then like to walk into the city to Trafalgar Square. And on that walk, I pass the Catholic Cathedral on the left, further on Westminster Abbey, across the road the Methodist Central Hall, and these are magnificent buildings, they're big, they're elaborate, and particularly Westminster Abbey, it's very ornate on the exterior of the building. We think of these as places of the house of God, that's how they're described. And we think of these buildings, and they're built to kind of declare people's faith, to proclaim our faith, our belief, our understanding in a great God, which is why so many churches have a spire pointing to heaven. But the reality is, they are of absolutely no significance. And I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that easily, but they are of absolutely no significance. The temple that Jesus came <coughs> Excuse me. The temple that Jesus claimed to purify was the temple of the human heart. Friends, when we talk about our faith, it is all dependent on our relationship with God, God the Father. And there's only one way for that relationship. It is through Jesus Christ, his Son. And we are told that Jesus came to take away the sin of the world, to save his people from their sins. And John the Baptist declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And yet so often we are trite and complacent and we just don't seem to grasp the enormity of what sin really is. Sin is the, the barrier between us and God and we can do nothing about it. I would defy anybody to wake up tomorrow morning and say from nine o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock in the evening, I'm not going to commit any sin. And just see how far in the day you get before you become impatient or irritated, before thoughts go through your mind that perhaps you shouldn't have. Whatever it might be, sin in some cases seems little and trivial, but actually it is the most enormous stain on the human heart, and it cannot be cleansed apart from Jesus Christ and him crucified.
So as he came down that hill and he saw all these people coming out and he wanted them, they wanted him to be the king. They tried to make him a king once before. They wanted a king to lead them against Rome. And he'd resisted, he'd walked away from them. And he knew that's what they were going to try and do again. They wanted a king who was a political leader because that is what they saw the problem as being. God the Father, Jesus the Son, see the problem differently. And as he came down that hill and he saw them, he wasn't laughing, he wasn't excited. And he went into the temple and he saw it being used as a marketplace. And worst of all, the part that was being used as a marketplace was the area where the Gentiles were allowed to go. The temple was divided into different parts. There was a place for the priests and the religious leaders, there was a place for the men, then a place for the women, and then a place for the Gentiles. And the place of the Gentiles was taken over by a market. So this great faith, which was to take the word of God out to the world, was just being completely mocked, and the world wasn't being made welcome. He went in, and he turned over the tables, and he was angry. We've talked about what happened in that place, in that market before, so we won't bother now, but it's pretty well known what goes on, what went on, the, the way that people were being tricked and conned out of paying good money for what they could get on the marketplace much cheaper. But I want to actually just for a minute, or really to look at a question. In verse 10, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? Who is this? That question is fundamental for every single person on this earth. Every person on this earth needs to answer that question. We know the answer that many people give. We see them at Christmas celebrating and all the different things that they buy for Christmas. On a normal year, people look forward to the Easter holidays. They know about Jesus. They know the stories of Jesus. They know the, the message the church presents and they completely ignore it. For many, many people, when they say about Jesus, they will say, oh yes, and they can tell you some stories about him. They've heard things from school. Some people used to go to church and they just got fed up with it and stopped going. And their idea of Jesus is somebody who might be, he might be the son of God, they don't know, he might be God, they don't know. The bottom line is really they don't care. When the Bible talks about godlessness, it's not talking about atheism. When it talks about godlessness in the Bible, it's talking about people who believe in God, who know God, but who actually live as though he's irrelevant, as though he doesn't matter. So they wake up in the morning, they go through the whole day, at the end, they've not given God a thought. Christmas Day, they celebrate with the tinsel, with the presents, with the drink, with the food. They don't give him a thought. Sometimes perhaps they'll think, well, okay, I'll go to church at Christmas and Easter. And because they go Christmas and Easter, they sell the conscience. But the question is, who is he? Who is this Jesus? If what the Bible teaches about Jesus is true, and I say if, if it's true, then no one can say they believe in him. No one can say he is the son of the living God and not be changed. It's impossible. If you realise the enormity of his identity, of who he is and what he's achieved, no one can ignore the consequence of that. Anybody who can say they're sitting on the fence, they're against him. He made it very clear, if you're not for us, you're against us. Jesus will not accept fence sitters. He wants people who will make a commitment, will believe and allow him to be Lord. I think Easter is a time to remind ourselves of the enormity of the Christian message, of the enormity of what happened. How can we comprehend a God who, within a short time of creation, saw mankind sin and then promised redemption? And he would send, send somebody who would defeat the devil. And who at that point would comprehend that that defeat would, be occur, would occur through the cross. But that's what happened. Jesus came humble and riding on a donkey. When he was in the wilderness, he was tempted by the devil. And one of the temptations, the devil said to him, 
I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will bow down and worship me. That was a temptation to dominate, to control by power. And yet this is a man, think of the descriptions of Jesus. John chapter 1, in the beginning God. In the beginning was the Word who was with God and was God. All things were created through him and for him. Paul says the same in Colossians. If what we read there is true, and I say if, if it's true, then as he rode down on the donkey, he had all the power in the universe, but he'd chosen not to use it. He'd chosen that he would lay that aside. He would come humbly as a man. He'd come with all the temptations and the difficulties that human beings face, and he would not sin. And because he bore all of our sins upon the cross, we don't have to bear the consequences. Because he took the wrath of God upon himself, we don't have to. And as he went down that hill towards Jerusalem, he knew that he was going now into the camp of the enemy and they were going to destroy him. But he also knew that this was part of God's plan. God was not being taken by surprise. He was not going to see, be described as a tragic mistake. This was part of the plan. He would be taken, he would be crucified, and as he said to the disciples earlier in the previous chapter, he would rise again. He would be raised to life. Not like Lazarus, who was raised with the exact body he had before, that he'd have to die again, but he'd have, Jesus would have the resurrection body, a body that we shall have when we die and we join him. Now why do I say if it's true? And why do I say if what we read? Because that's the answer you've got to decide. Some of us watching this and listening have been Christians for many, many years. Other, others of us have been Christians for a short time. It may be that for some of us we've been Christians weeks. We have to answer that question, who is Jesus? Is the Bible true? Do I believe he's the only son of the living God? That as he rode humbly down that hill going towards Jerusalem, he knew what was going to happen to him, that he would die, that upon the cross he'd enter hell. Did he know all of that? The Bible says he did. And just to put your minds at rest, I believe it. I believe it completely. And it's my experience of this Saviour that he is so gentle. In Luke, when he, Luke accounts him weeping, he was weeping because he knew what was going to happen to those people. If you have any ideas, any images of an angry God who's waiting to get the baddies in front of him when he can just strike them and send them to hell, dispel them, get rid of them, because that's not the image the Bible gives. The image gives, and the Bible gives an image of a God who is reaching out to a disobedient people who treat him with contempt, they spore, scorn his name, they, they do anything they want, and they just ridicule him and people laugh, and he's reaching out gently. How can we call the God of the universe humble? But he is. And when Jesus wept, it wasn't because, well, it wasn't for himself, it was entirely for them. And as he went into the temple and he cleared out the money changers, I don't think God would have given two hoots about that temple, that building, because that building was of no consequence. But what was of consequence was the hearts of the people that God in Jesus is reaching out to. And he's doing it now. He's reaching out to people. He wants them to know this truth. He does not want them to be lost. Jesus went into the city humbly, riding on a donkey. He had decided he was going to take the path of servitude and sacrifice. And he says, follow me to each one of us on the same path. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen.